So uh, please uh, be intentional about it. I don't just hear something, but be intentional and say, uh, God, help me to bear witness at every opportunity that you give me and speak of Christ as I ought. And then lastly, uh, be praying for Madeline. Uh, our elder Daniel will be praying, leading us through prayer later. We pray for Madeline. She's still in mission in Slovenia. Uh, they'll be back in about 10 or 11 days or so. Well, I'm going to call you to worship. Uh, oh, sorry, if, if you're visiting or a guest, just those grey doors, which are actually open anyway, just go out through those. Cry room, uh, toilet amenities, and then after the service, please stay uh, and join us in some morning tea. Uh, John 1, we're going to sing in a moment, Behold the Lamb of God. Uh, here is in, in beginning of... Remember John's Gospel, basically the whole Gospel uh, would, would cover about maybe 19, 20 days of Jesus' life. And John just picks out those 19 or 20 days and that's his whole Gospel. And so it's always important what he picks out. And in John 1, people are saying, who is this one, who is he? And they're asking questions. A little bit later on in John, in when the first disciples are called in John 1, it says that they came to him asking if he was the one and he says to them, who are you seeking? Or what are you seeking? Really should be seeking a who, but what are you seeking? Everybody's seeking something. And in that context, John 1.29 says, the next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove and it remained on him. And I myself did not know him. But he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, On whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And what are you seeking? If you're seeking grace, if you're seeking God, as you gather this morning, if you're seeking to worship him and find his goodness, then you've come to the right place. Let's pray. Eternal Father, we thank you that uh, you have extended your kindness, your goodness, your patience, your, your grace to us through that covenantal promises between the Trinity uh, that you might save a people to yourself and then in the fullness of time, Christ, the promised one, the Messiah, the one who was anointed, he came. Though, though he was veiled by flesh and they did not recognize him, John recognized him. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He takes away our sin. He takes away the sin of all those who look to him. All those who trust in him, all those who would seek him. Well, we seek you this morning by your grace. And we ask that in Christ that you would speak to us, encourage us, rebuke, correct and train us through your word and through the ministry of your spirit so that we would find in Christ hope, encouragement, uh, forgiveness of our sin, uh, strength to add virtues to our faith so that our lives and our worship, that they might be acceptable to you. If there is any amongst us this morning as we gather in public worship that are still seeking, we pray they would find no rest until they find it in him. That, Father, you would be pleased to glorify your Son, draw people to yourself, forgive your people, and enable us to sing your praises. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's stand and we'll sing our first song of praise. Behold the Lamb of God. He 
walked on earth, showing glimpses of heaven. Demons, death, disease had no hand. The wind and the waves were obedient before him. Well, may they say, who is this man? Kids coming up for kids talk. Hopefully this stays on. <laughs> Bye kids. Who's well today? Yeah. Where's Ethan McGilvery? Where is he? Buddy, you look a bit bigger today. Have you grown up? How old are you now? Five. Amazing. And where's Clara? Clara here? Did you have a birthday too? A party. Does that mean you haven't grown up? Oh, really? How old are you going to turn on Monday? Congratulations. Happy birthday. So, kids, um, let's do the kids cat. What have we been looking at over the last four weeks? We've been focusing on a specific topic. Can anyone remember what that is? Yes. The covenant. That's right. Can anyone explain to us what a covenant is? Angus? Yes, and a, co a covenant is an agreement between two or more people. And what was the covenant that God made with Adam? Henry? Covenant of works? That's right. And in that covenant, what was Adam bound by? Yes? 
Exactly. Yeah, in the covenant of works, God's expectation of Adam was that he was to obey, obey God perfectly. So, we know that a covenant is an agreement between two or more people. We know that God made a covenant with Adam, and that was the covenant called works. And in that covenant, God's expectation of Adam was that he was to obey God perfectly. What was God's promise to Adam in the covenant? Someone else? Yes? Ooh, that was the threat. Does anyone remember the covenant? Oh, sorry, the promise. Someone who hasn't answered a question yet. Who hasn't answered a question that wants to answer it? Yes? Life, yes, life, that's right. God's promise to Adam was life. Um, But Adam was already alive, right? So what was God talking about there? Yep. Eternal, do you think he meant eternal life? Yeah. Life forever in heaven. That's right. So today we're talking about the threat that God made Uh, in the covenant of works. Before we look at that, we've got a little video that helps to illustrate the idea of a threat um, in an agreement. So, Sebi. What did Daddy do wrong? He, 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 he taken her seatbelt off. Naughty Daddy. So where's Daddy now? What, What have you done with Daddy? I made to time out. Did you? Did I come off time out? No, I had to talk to you before you come off time out. Okay. Daddy, when you take your, when you try, you have to drive and keep your seatbelt on and don't do it. So, you have to say sorry. I'm sorry for taking my seatbelt off, I said. <coughs> Friends again? Yeah. You forgive sorry. me? Sorry, Isaac. I know you're not going to forgive me for that. For those who couldn't quite hear the audio, the reason I was sent to time out was because in our house, if you take your, or the agreement is that when the car is moving, you must have your seatbelt on. Now, I had broken that agreement and I'd taken my seatbelt off as I was driving down the driveway to our garage, and Isaac had correctly picked me up on it, and as a result, I had to go to timeout. So that was my consequence for breaking the agreement. So God has made an agreement with Adam, and there's a consequence for not fulfilling that agreement. The agreement is that Adam is to obey God perfectly, And if he disobeys God even once, what happens? Yes. Yeah, he dies. On the spot? On the spot? No. He just he doesn't get eternal life. Yeah? But it's a it's a pretty you know, comparative to the threat or the consequence uh, in the Tesdorf house for not keeping your seatbelt on, it's a, a pretty severe consequence, isn't it? It's um It's a little bit scary, um, but the good thing is we're no longer bound by the covenant of works. We have a new covenant, and we're going to learn about that new covenant in coming weeks. It's called the covenant of grace, um, but what that means is that we have hope. We all have hope for eternal life, so even though we can't perfectly obey God's, um, God's law, um, we still have hope for eternal life with him. So... Um, let's repeat the answer to the question. We'll repeat the question, repeat the answer, and then we'll pray. So what was God's threat to Adam in the covenant of works? Let's say it all, all out loud. God's threat to Adam was, was death. Yes. All right. Well, let's bow our heads and pray to God. Thank you, Lord. Um, For these children, thank you that you love them and that you want to see them um, saved. 
Lord God, we pray for their salvation. Uh, we thank you that you have uh, given us the, the covenant of grace to replace the covenant of works, and that in that, through Jesus, we have a hope of eternal life. I pray that these children would come to love, serve, uh, love and serve you. Uh, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Ah, right, let's sing a song. from God's Word this morning um, from the book of Job in between Esther and the Psalms. In the Church Bibles it is on page 494. So we're reading from Job chapter 5 from verse 17 to 27 speaking about God's discipline. Call now, oh, I'm sorry, Behold, blessed is the one whom God reproves. Therefore, despise not the discipline of the Almighty. For he wounds, but he binds up. He shatters, but his hands heal. He will deliver you from six troubles. In seven, no evil shall touch you. In famine, he will redeem you from death. And in war, from the power of the sword. You shall be hidden from the lash of the tongue and shall not fear destruction when it comes. At destruction and famine you shall laugh and shall not fear the beasts of the earth. For you shall be in league with the stones of the field and the beasts of the field shall be at peace with you. You shall know that your tent is at peace and you shall inspect your fold and miss nothing. You shall know also that your offspring shall be many and your descendants as the grass of the earth. You shall come to your grave in ripe old age like a sheaf gathered up in its season. Behold, this we have searched out. It is true. Hear and know it for your good. This is the word of the Lord. If you have your Bibles open, turn them to the book of Proverbs or find them in your phone. Just by way of recap, if you perhaps are unfamiliar with Proverbs, what we've been doing, we've been spent the last uh, couple of months in Proverbs. Uh, just so you understand the structure of Proverbs, that uh, Proverbs 1 to 9 is the gateway to the proverbial sayings. And the point of Proverbs 1 to 9, when you get to the end, which we will eventually get to chapter 9, chapter 9, you're posed with a question, with whom will you dine? Woman wisdom or woman folly? And, and at, at the time, of course, one pointed to Yahweh, another to the foreign gods that surrounded them. 
And then all the way through Proverbs, it talks about paths. And it uses a metaphor for life, that everybody chooses a path. Everybody's walking a path. And if you're not walking the path of wisdom, you're walking the path that leads to eternal destruction. Even if it's power and pleasure all the way along. And we saw that in recent weeks where uh, in chapter 5 you get the warnings against uh, adultery and uh, sexual immorality. And you know, that can derail. And then in chapter 6, we've just been looking at, and we just saw in verses 1 through to 15, you get these warnings again about uh, the need for integrity and industry in the path of wisdom and its fruitfulness, lest that becomes uh, a thing that distracts from your witness. And then what we're going to do in verses 16 to 19, remember that, so last Lord's Day, we saw in verses 11 through to 15, that's the worthless person. So the person who walks wisdom walks in integrity and industry, and then the worthless man is juxtaposed. And so what you're getting in verses 16 to 19 is a picture of that worthless person. What? And you get this very strong language about what God hates. And you sort of need to feel the weight of that as we go through the text today. So I'm reading... From God's word, let's turn our minds towards it. Reading from chapter 6, verses 16 through to verse 19. This is the word of the Lord. There are six things that that the Lord hates, seven, that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and the one who sows discord amongst brothers. Amen. May the Lord give us understanding of his word. I'm going to pray and ask for God's presence and blessings for us, and then you'll hear from the word. Father, we... We thank you that we can call upon your name and your goodness and your promises. And we know that your word itself is, is powerful, sharp than any double-edged sword. It's like a hammer that shatters rocks. And so we would pray as we sit under your word this morning that the Spirit would do his work to glorify your Son and build up your church. And to this end, we pray even the weakness and folly of preaching might be harnessed by your Spirit to those very ends. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Ever seen those um, those little chop chips, like that that big chop chips? You actually buy them in uh, little packets at your supermarket, uh, and you use them. Not that the blokes would know. You use this in cooking, and the thing is, how often? Would any of you think of those little choc chips? Like, when was the last time that passed your life? I mean, no one. If you're a bloke here, you, this will be the first time you've ever thought about, well, actually, there's a couple of blokes over there. I reckon you've had choc chips. But putting those blokes aside, for the rest of us, just it's not a thing that's on our radar. We would never think about those little packets of choc chips. Almost never. Certainly not this year. Possibly not in a decade. Some of you have not even crossed your mind. And, and the thing is, you're sort of thinking, who cares? That's right, they're chalk chips. No one cares, right? <laughs> We've got wars going on in the Middle East. Who cares about chalk chips? Well, the point is, no one cares about chalk chips until you care about chalk chips when you're trying to make chalk chip cookies. As soon as like, it might be you know, shared prayer and lunch Sunday and someone says, ooh, make some chalk chip cookies. Well, it's the first thing you're going to think of. Do we have any chalk chips? Because without chalk chips, you don't have a chalk chip cookie. You just have a cookie. Chalk chips, as insignificant as they are, they are an essential ingredient if you want chalk chip biscuits, cookies, whatever they're called. A bit like eggs to scrambled eggs. Or, or avocados to, um, let me just say if I can pronounce it, 
uh, guacamole. Is that, is that it? Is that what it is? I'll, I'll be honest with you. I googled avocado first. Uh, never had an avocado in my life. I thought it might have been a vegetable, so I'll try to stay away from it. But, but, but the point is, you can't have this guacamole, whatever that thing is. Sounds like a nation. But anyway, whatever that is, apparently an essential ingredient for that is an avocado. Do you know what an essential ingredient is for North, for us, to stay focused on the gospel? Do you want to know what that essential ingredient is for us to remain effective and productive in the kingdom of God? Do you want to know what the essential ingredient is if we want to have a community of believers that is not shallow but deep? Do you want to know what that essential ingredient is if we want to remain a place of gentleness and and grace and forgiveness and gospel focus? Not, not just taught and preached, but modelled. That essential ingredient is unity. Without unity, if you're not unified around Christ and his gospel, if there's no unity around that, then you'll never be effective and productive in the kingdom of God. Without unity, and for the congregation of the family of God to be focused on, on his kingdom and his glory so that every knee would bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is the Lord. Without that unity, you know what you are? You're just a church on a Sunday running a worship service that you punch your worship card. And you, and it could be any one of you, You have the ability to destroy that unity. To ruin that fellowship. To cause division amongst the family of believers. And the worst part of that is it is so easy to do. Instead of adding virtues to your faith, just allow pride and envy and malice, jealousy, Anger, just let them do what they do, disrupt, divide. And so God's word for you today, it's a warning actually, it's a warning really, that unchecked, disordered desires, that they have the potential to distract or even destroy gospel witness. I hope you take that seriously. I hope you feel a weight of that. Woe be to the person who is the sower of discord. Because our text tells us that arouses a holy hatred. Christians who cause divisions, Christians who sow seeds of discourse, discord in the church, Christians who essentially do the work of the evil one, Sure, they don't think that's what they're doing, but they do the work of the evil one in actually hindering the gospel. Christians who cause conflict, diverting, and in some extreme cases, even splitting congregations. Those people, Proverbs says, they arouse God's holy hatred. That's a solemn thing. And that's the message today and the warning from wisdom. So let's look at the text, verse 16. There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. That's the first thing. You read that and you go, uh, six things the Lord hates. Hold on. The omniscient gods just remembered there was the seventh thing. Okay, obviously that's not. It's a formula. It's Hebrew poetry. And it's actually this literary device that is designed to highlight the last thing in the list. And that, in a sense, almost becomes a summary of the other things. So, for example, Karen read to us from Job, Job 5, 19, you read, and he will deliver you from six troubles in seven, no evil shall touch you. The whole point is what he's saying there is that 
you know, in six troubles, all these difficulties, the Lord, the King, the Sovereign One, He's not going to allow evil. No. And then He says, the seventh. And it drives it home that no evil shall touch you if that is God's will for you. And He will deliver you time and time and time again. And I can guarantee you, believers, that in your life He has delivered you so many times from the evil of others and from the folly of your own sin. And that same formula, it's used about a dozen times in the book of Amos. That's how the whole of Amos starts, Amos 1 and 2, time and time again. It's about God's judgment on Israel, but also the surrounding nations. And it says, for three transgressions of Damascus and for four. And then the same formula, for three transgressions of Gaza and for four. For three transgressions of Edom and for four, what will it do? God's judgment will come upon them for their sins. Is a, is a literary formula, and, it, and it's used here by Solomon in Proverbs 6. And the six things he lists find their telos or their end or their focal point in the main point, the seventh thing in the text. That's the important thing. That's the thing that arouses a holy hatred. And Proverbs 6 says, it is the one who sows discord amongst brothers. That's what gets God angry. That's what unleashes his wrath, even amongst those in the covenant community. So let's, we'll go through it quickly and we'll get to the seventh and we'll land there and then we'll try to think through some of the implications and applications that flow from that. Six things that God hates and notice when he does it, he sort of describes a person, the worthless person that we saw in the earlier verses. He's describing the body of a person, eyes, tongues, breath, heart, hands, feet. Describing a person, six things. And he starts off with, a, with the haughty eyes. The haughty eyes are the eyes that always overestimate oneself and probably underestimate others. Proud eyes that believe that the, you know, their insight, their judgment, that's the correct one. The proud eyes that are convinced that their opinion is not only right, but it must be heard. The proud eyes that expect their ado- ideas to be adopted. And when they're not, Those proud eyes easily become lying tongues. And by that, I I don't mean that they make up lies. That is covered by false witness that breathes out lies in the text. And of course, you corner someone like that, and they feel rejected and angry, they'll probably, no doubt, speak falsehoods. They'll attempt to create a narrative that would suit them, that would probably vindicate them, something that would justify them. But here, the idea is more subtle. It means that the tongue that speaks, you know, like the tongue or the person that speaks first sounds right. The tongue that describes the situation according to them. The tongue that doesn't share facts, but an interpretation of them. And usually, usually, not always, but usually, Attached to that is they assume motives. They have this omniscient gift where they can assume the actions of someone else. I actually know what you intended. I actually know what drove your heart. And if time goes on and they do not get what they want, what does James say? Why are you angry? You didn't get what you want. Whenever you're angry, ask that question to yourself. In your marriage, with your kids, In church, why am I angry? It's because I didn't get something I desired. And so they get angry and destructive. And if ultimately they fail in their purpose, whatever that might be, and their anger cools over time, they get depressed and bitter, which often depression is just anger gone cold. Leave it long enough, that depression becomes bitterness. In our text, Solomon says that they go on to shed blood, innocent blood, in a time of very little police, 
anger often easily would spill into murder. And, you know, obviously that doesn't. The closest thing you are going to get to being murdered is by one of my long, boring sermons. You are fairly safe in this church. But make no mistake, people attack others. Uh, leaders, elders, ministry leaders often get verbally attacked by their brethren. In fact, anyone who opposes them and their sin, they attack others in a way that discourages, sometimes breaks and ruins people and congregations. The text then goes on to say, speaks of their hearts. In their hearts, it says they're devising wicked plans because they want to win. They're in an argument of their life. They're in a, this is, this is, they decide they're going to, this is it. This is the hill on which they die. And so they will win. They're like Middletons who have a little motto in their home. Middletons don't give in. Well, when you're in the wrong, you should give in. When you're doing sin, you should give in. But they're not going to give in because they're devising a plan in their heart. I don't know how they're going to get their own way. How I'm going to bend the church and the leaders in my direction. Often what they do is they work to secure support from other people. So they work the congregation, work other families, invite them into their homes, and then speak about a narrative, their interpretation. They'll often assert what they believe is motives. And they're pondering in the heart, how do I get what I want? How am I going to win? Who do I have to win over? So they arrange secret meetings with other people. And they whisper stories. Project motives. And I shouldn't have to tell you this. You should already know this. But you should shut a person like that down. You should shut it down. Actually, shouldn't listen to them vent. Not falsehoods. Shouldn't actually, there's nothing godly about being patient, letting them vent and speak ill of others. There's nothing winsome about listening to them as they assert motives in which they can't possibly know because they're not omniscient. They do not know the motives of anyone else. They can just project. And if you're silent, it is seen as either indifference or support. And seriously, if you really did love them, if you really did love the gospel, if you really did love Christ's bride, the church, then you would call this out for what it is. It's just sin. In all of its ugliness. Matthew 15, 19 says, From out of the heart comes evil thoughts. Unsurprisingly then, Solomon says, And so their feet make haste. Evil. That is, he's describing a sort of an enthusiasm about what they're doing. The way they're conducting themselves. They have a mission and it's no longer to make disciples who make disciples. The mission is to win at all costs. Whatever the dispute. And so their feet are making haste. They're animated. More animated probably than they are in their private devotions. And they're feeding rumours. And they're encouraging rebellion. And they're openly assassinating another brother or sister's character. And so the text says that ultimately they are a false witness who breathes out lies. And he's, he's drawing the picture for you. And then you get to the seventh thing. That's the sixth. He gets to the seventh. Because that's a picture who sows, of a person who sows discord amongst the brethren, amongst Christ's church. And do you know what? 
let's even say this person has a legitimate concern. Let's even, let's even say it started out as a legitimate concern. But because of this, it's sort of marinated in evil. And it's become twisted and disordered. And I reckon all of us have met someone like that. All of us have encountered a situation like that. Maybe some of us were like that. And these people break friendships. They make family relationships difficult. Because it's often a pattern of behaviour. Remember the concentric circles we talked about. Family. Church and friends. What a culture. And we have certain duties in those areas that are close to us that God has given us responsibilities. And those wider concentric circles, we just have opportunities. But when it comes to sin in the church, you have a duty. You have a duty. And of course the elders have responsibilities to do certain things. But you have a duty as a believer to call out sin and not to enable it or amplify it or encourage it. Why would you do that? It's a thing that God hates. You have to learn how to hate what he hates and love what he loves. There's that well-known, there's a, there's a story when I first became a Christian, I was reading a discipleship book and, and the very opening illustration of the discipleship book, which I'm just going to do from memory with a bit of changing, but here's the gist of it. It's about a story about a bloke and, and all in his public prayers, he would say... Um, Lord, remove the cobwebs of my heart. And the first time you hear that, you think, oh, that's, that's slightly poetic. I get that. Uh, I've got a few cobwebs myself. That'd be good. Clean them out. But every prayer meeting, you pray. <laughs> every time he prays, he prays that prayer. Lord, remove the cobwebs of my heart. And he's in a public meeting and he, and he starts his prayer. He does the same thing. Lord, remove the cobwebs of my heart. And finally, one of the elders interrupts and says, Lord, can we just please kill the spider? That's a better prayer. Kill the spider. Lord, please kill the spider. Forget the cobwebs. Get to the cause. We often let sin like cobwebs just gather. And we're reluctant to kill the spider. So Solomon has led us through these six things that God hates because he wants to land on the seventh thing, the most important thing, the thing that arouses a divine, this, this holy hatred. Because God's anger, God's wrath is just. Ours is often impure, but his is just. And he's saying that the one who claims to follow Jesus, the one who says that they are conformed to Scripture, the one who are supposed to obey their leaders, the one who is now causing division and making their elders' work difficult, that's the seventh thing, he says. That's the seventh thing. The one who sows discord among the brothers, that's what God really hates. The one in their mind who knows or they think they are in the right. The one who is convinced they know what should be done. The one who is actually determined at any cost, including division, to get their way. And sometimes it, it, it can be a woman with strong convictions that just believe the leadership is wrong. Sometimes it's an immature Christian who's just angry that his voice is not heard or heeded. Sometimes it's, it's a bloke even in leadership that for whatever disordered desires wants to win in a debate and he's happy to destroy the unity of the leadership and the church in the process. We've seen it all. And so they do what God hates and they start sowing like this, wherever they go, all the meetings, in their conversations, in their homes, they're sowing seeds of discord 
amongst those whom Christ has loved and drawn into his bride church. And it starts with pride. And whether that's the overinflated kind or the deflated, discouraged kind, it starts with pride. Because pride insists that I'm better. Pride, my opinion, actually deserves to be heard. It's heated even. And if not, I'll actually let you know that I'm not happy with this. My discontent will be obvious in your midst. And you see, pride's sister is selfishness. And that's what selfishness does. Selfishness says, it's actually about me. Self, you know, the, the selfish person, it doesn't ever dawn on them, even if you're right. Let's just say you are right. And all the elders are wrong. All your youth leaders are wrong. Or all your Bible studies leaders are wrong. But even if you're in the right, does your vindication, is, is it worth destroying relationships? Unity? We're not talking about doctrine. There's a day to fight for doctrine. That's not what the text is talking about. It's talking about a divisive person. And what selfishness does, it makes church about you. And church is not about you. It is not about you. It's not about your lovely kids either. It's about Christ. And it's about what he is doing in this world. It's about the coming of his kingdom of which we're invited by the gospel to not only enjoy that salvation of which the children were learning that comes in that covenant of grace, but also participate in the witness of that kingdom. And that's a privilege. And dividing a church, dividing God's purposes on earth, couldn't be further from Christ and the kingdom. The idea that you'd be full of pride and you would put your pride before unity, you couldn't be further from Christ. This is the God who, who veils his glory and actually takes on human flesh that he might obey the law on our behalf and then be spat on and beaten and rejected and mocked and stripped naked and nailed to a cross, humbled even unto death, the scriptures say. But we're going to be, pro we're going to be full of pride and divide. Are you kidding me? Couldn't get further from the gospel. And the thing is, the proud and the selfish person have a way of just gossiping and speaking poorly of others. And that whenever they're engaging others, it's not to seek wisdom. It's not to say, brother, sister, I need your wisdom. I have an issue. I, I need to deal with it in a godly fashion. Give me some guidance. No, no, no. It's, it's, it's to justify or vindicate. And the text says they're doing what God hates. And worse than that, they're numbered amongst the assembly. <laughs> and so they're di sowing discord. And here's a warning because in, in Proverbs 16, 18, and the idea is time you get through chapter 9, you've, you've chosen to dine with woman wisdom, which is Christ. And then with Christ, then you get all this wisdom on how to navigate life and to do that well. And part of that is Proverbs 16, 18, that the whisperer, that's what it calls them, the whisperer, it separates close friends. And then Proverbs 17, 19 says that the one who repeats a matter also separates close friends. You see what's going on? Because the one who hears and entertains the divisive person and listens to their whispers then they're often going on and repeating the whispers, whatever the context. And their willingness to listen without rebuke actually enables. If you listen to the divisive person without correction, without rebuke, without bringing the word of God to bear upon them, you're actually enabling them. It may not be your intention, but that's what's happening. And then if you go repeating those things because they're juicy, or they're interesting, 
And they're not going to hurt you. It's going to hurt someone else. What you do is you amplify the discord. So how should we respond as God's people to the, this thing that God hates? The first thing is you, you just avoid the divisive person. You just avoid them. I realize divisive people come in all different shapes and sizes. Some are just annoying. Their lives are a bit messed up. They're disgruntled. They're angry. Their anger's gone cold now. They're depressed and bitter about the way things have turned out. And it sort of just ruminates in the congregation. And, and, and sometimes it's just this annoyance at the side. That's not really the picture here. The picture here is someone who's far more active in that divisiveness. Romans 16, 17 says, Watch out for those who cause divisions and avoid them. In fact, in Titus is told to reject those who are divisive in Titus 3.10. And so I'm telling you, here's the first thing. Avoid divisive people. Just avoid them. Don't enable them. Don't amplify them. Add virtue, add that virtue of courage we've been talking about to your faith. And if you are courageous, you know what to do. You bring the scriptures to bear and you rebuke and you correct. But you don't enable and amplify Second thing you do you can refuse to get caught up in matters that are sort of outside of your concentric circles or at least in your responsibilities and duties. If it's a matter that you don't have a duty under God to deal with then while it might be an opportunity to bring unity in a situation it's not a duty. You know, if someone's unhappy at North and there's always someone unhappy, and sometimes they're unhappy for dodgy reasons, but sometimes they're reasonable reasons. And they talk to you, send them to the elders. That's what you do. You say, that's beyond my reach, it's beyond my responsibility, but look, go to the elders. And I'm telling you now, if you're unhappy with something that happens up north, if you're concerned we're not following the scriptures, if you've got an issue that you think is genuine and needs to be dealt with, whether it's a personal or even a doctrinal matter, you always come to your elders. You will get a hearing. Guaranteed. We will listen to you. We will always be gentle with you. We, we, we're not we're not, we're not going to be defensive and aggressive. We'll be gentle. And when you question our wisdom and our decision making, we get it. Because sometimes we do get it wrong. We certainly got it wrong in the past. And we've owned that publicly. We are not infallible. But that's the biblical model. You come to your elders. But you don't be divisive and talk. And your elders will hear you in humility. But here's what I also want you to recognize. There may be details and issues and matters that you are actually unaware of. So you have part of a story. You've got the tiger's tail or the tiger's foot. And you think that's the whole thing. And it's not. And the elders at times are not at liberty to give you all the information because it relates to other people and they have a right of privacy. And this is where we have to be humble. Because the elders and the deacons, or it might be a board member, will make decisions prayerfully, but which they think is right in a corporate scripture and which is good for the whole congregation and the mission to make disciples who make disciples. And sometimes when we make decisions, there are tensions. There are tensions. We, we feel the tensions. There are different issues at play. That's why you should actually pray for your elders, as the scripture tells you to do. But don't be divisive. Don't be that person. 
Don't be that one who actually thinks that your issue, your thing, your dispute, that it is worth dividing Christ's church. Because it's not. Not unless, not unless it's an issue of the gospel. Scripture says, and I want you to feel the weight of it today, God hates the one who sows discord among brothers. Why? Because every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. And no city on a house divided against itself will stand. That's what Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 12, verse 25. Christ died. That, and there's, there's, I tell you, there's a theological reason and there's a mission reason and there's a worship reason why you should not be divisive. Because theologically, God is one. And the church is meant to be a picture of that. In fact, the, not just that, but the church is a hermeneutic both of God himself and the gospel. It's a hermeneutic means how you understand something. You know how you get to understand the unity of the Trinity? Because of the unity of the church. You know how you get a picture of what it is, the sweetness of the gospel? Because of the church. The church is the hermeneutic of the gospel. It is the entree for the gospel course. It is actually meant to be a foretaste of divine love where you are fully known and truly loved. And as you let that weight of that, that we don't want to, A, theologically, in our division, paint a different picture to the unity of Christ, and, and secondly, we don't, want to, we don't want to distract the congregation or divide a congregation or discourage a congregation from what God has called them to do, which is to worship Him and to make witness to Him. And whether you have personally been the sower of discord, or whether you've been the enabler or the amplifier, whether you've actually lacked courage, the virtue of courage, whether you've lacked that in the past, and you've never confronted the whisperer, whether you have lacked the courage to love what God loves and to hate what God hates, then today there's room for repentance. Today, I think, if every single one of us, in varying degrees, knows what it's like, when we just want to be right, we just want to get our way, and we become divisive. We do it in our homes. We often do it in a the church. Some of you here will need to repent because you've actually lacked courage. You've known you've got a whisperer and you haven't enabled necessarily or not intentionally, but you certainly haven't amplified, but you haven't had the courage to confront them with Scripture and say, you know what? You either go to the person, Matthew 18, directly or you go to your elders. Outside of that, this is all just false testimony and whisper. It's just whispering. And it's unhelpful, even if the issue is an issue that ought to be dealt with. And I think in varying degrees, we all feel the weight of that. We've all failed at some point at that. And yet, what gives us a unity is that in Christ, there is grace. In Christ, there is forgiveness. In Christ, there is transformation. In Christ, there is renewal for all those who repent and turn to him. Let's do that in prayer. Father, we, we take seriously uh, the words of Solomon here in Scripture. You hate divisiveness hate the sower of discord. It, it does it. It arouses a holy wrath because you have put together your people. You have gathered them by your gospel. You have blessed them with grace and numbered them for your son and for his kingdom. 
You have purposed them with a work and a witness, filling them with your spirit. And yet, at times, we are willing to risk all that, to ruin all that. We often do it in our homes, let alone the church, where our grumbling and discontent, rather than taking it to the Lord, rather than searching our own hearts, rather than confessing our sin, that we're angry because we did not get what we wanted, rather than acknowledging that our dissatisfaction is not with others, not with leadership, not with the church, not with our home, not with our spouse. It's actually with you that we have our benefit, that we're unhappy because your hand has not brought us to places we want to be. It's not given us the things that we thought we deserved. Oh, how we need grace. Oh, how we need Christ. Would you forgive us even now, each and every one of us? Would you pour out your covenant mercies? Would you remind us of your promises and truth that if, that if anyone were to confess their sin, that you are faithful and just and you promise to cleanse us of all of our unrighteousness? Every bit. The stuff that we confess, the stuff that we remember, but the stuff even that we've forgotten. That your mercy might extend to that. That you would heal our hearts and our homes and our congregations. And that we might take seriously this call to unity around the gospel and around Christ and his word. And that unity bears witness to this world of a community of grace that runs deep. And so, our Heavenly Father, we commit ourselves to you and we ask all these things, the forgiveness of our every sin. And we do it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, let's respond by way of song. We're going to stand and sing our song of response. May the mind of Christ my Saviour live in me.
We're going to come to our God with our prayers for one another and for our world. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we come before you as a, a, a group of your people humbly because you are indeed the one true God, the all-powerful, almighty one who has deigned to love us, who has sent your only son into the world to take on our form, to be like us, to be subject to the same conditions that we are, and yet he was without sin and he lived a perfect life. He died the death that was our death. He's paid our debt and opened the way to reconciliation. And it's in that spirit that we come to you. Father, we thank you that we are in fact one in Christ. This is a truth, a reality. Uh, we don't always practice it well, but it is nevertheless true. And we thank you, uh, even as Darren has already prayed, that we are uh, one in, in Christ, that we are to be a unified people and we need your help to do that but we we pray that not just for ourselves we think more broadly of other churches in this region particularly other presbyterian churches of, of whom we are in partnership with through the presbytery uh, we think of the ballerine and geelong west uh, of uh, Inverlee and bannockburn father we thank you for the work that has already begun and we are also uh, excited about uh, opportunities where there are uh, suburbs growing and expanding, places where the gospel is yet to be planted and heard and congregations yet to be formed. Father, all of these uh, we would bring to you our, our desires that the gospel might be heard and be evident as you work in each congregation bringing about that unity that we uh, so much desire and have heard about this morning. But Father, even beyond ourselves, we think of uh, other denominations everywhere where your word is preached uh, where your people uh, bow to Christ as Lord and where you have called to yourself uh, individuals and then you've knit them together in, in congregations that we call the church to bear witness to the world of the love that you have for us. So, Father, help your church to be what you designed it to be, what you have called it to be, that we might come out of the culture of uh, selfishness and pride and that we might learn a new way, thanks to your spirit at work within our hearts, that your church around this nation might declare the good news of Jesus Christ and have good and powerful effect at every level of government and every level of society, that good may come, that you may bless us as a nation and we as a nation might bless the world. Father, we're conscious that that unity is not felt in all places, and not just in your church, but even uh, as, as every person is made in the image of God and we are to love one another, that should be evident in all society. But there are places where there is much conflict and our media uh, focuses our attention on particular areas like Israel and the Gaza Strip at the moment and Lebanon, uh, the Middle East in, in various forms, Ukraine and Russia. But there are so many other places in, uh, in almost every continent where there is unrest, there is disharmony, there is man fighting against man, where the strong seek to overpower the weak, where evil men rise up to take advantage and all for self-interest. Father, we pray against such things. We cannot know the entirety or the depth of the problem, but you know. We do not know the solution, for it's beyond our wisdom, but it's not beyond yours. We don't have the ability to address every wrong in every place and to protect the innocent, for all of that is beyond us. But you are the almighty God, and to you we pray. Bring peace. Strengthen the hand of the righteous. Restrain evil. Bring victory to those who serve your good purpose. Provide food and shelter to those who have lost everything. Bring comfort to those who mourn. And bring peace and reconciliation, firstly with you, the only true and living God. And then, as your love flows through us, may there be peace, one with the other. Father, today is a, a day of great celebration for us as a congregation. We 
thinking of uh, that theme of unity and we have a marriage this afternoon, a wedding ceremony, and we give thanks for the great celebration that that is as Shane and Katie uh, come together to make vows to each other. We pray that you would bless them with grace, the grace to take those vows seriously, uh, that they might keep them uh, not only the days ahead but the decades ahead. Uh, what starts new today, we pray you would keep fresh for them, that they might know the delights of your love and live in the, the, the sunshine of your face, your countenance upon them. Father, we uh, occasions like this remind us of uh, our marriage vows, each of us, uh, and the commitment that we have made some very long time ago. And too often in our weakness, we fail each other and we fail you. And that unity that we spoke of in the church is not even evident in our homes. Father, help us in our marriages to practice what we preach. That we might be quick to acknowledge our guilt when we have done wrong. That we might feel the full weight of Christ's sacrifice for us. And that we might turn quickly with a deep and a sincere repentance that we might flee from evil and flee to the safety and the delight of reconciliation, that, that oneness that can only come as we seek to serve you, the oneness that we find with you and then with each other. So help us to reflect your covenant love. Strengthen our marriage as we pray, that it might strengthen good society and it might aid in our witness. Father, as a congregation, we have a needs. There are those amongst us who are sick um, and, and some who aren't able to even be here because they are so unwell. And we would think this morning of Kathy and of Jasper and of Mark and Matthew and Henry who all have illnesses of various kinds and, and others with injuries like Matt and Elsa and Holly and Sylvia. And Father... So many of us are carrying ailments of various kinds and even seasonal challenges, uh, mental, physical, all kinds of, of adversities. And we pray that you would help each to struggle with the adversity for your good purpose. Build our character and strengthen our faith. Discipline us where necessary and, and develop within each of us uh, the person that you intend us to be so that we might be restored to good health in time and according to your good purpose, and that we might know your blessing and your care for us in our time of need, and that that would fuel our testimony to what a great God you are. Father, we would pray this morning too for ministries within our congregation, ways in which we tend to uh, reach out to each other and even out into the community. We pray particularly this morning for Darren as he carries a very heavy load at present and we ask that you would strengthen him and grant him uh, sufficient wisdom and uh, efficiency, good organisation, that he would be productive in achieving your purposes, uh, not only through him but also in him. Uh, we thank you for his leadership and for his sacrifice, for his love for us and the diligence with which he attends to his duties uh, each day and week by week opens up your word and helps us to grow in our love for Christ and in our witness for him. Father, we pray too for the session as they meet this week and we ask that uh, you would give great wisdom, uh, courage, uh, sensitivity, gentleness, uh, humility to each of the elders and that as we review this past year and as we look forward to the coming year that you might grant foresight that we might shepherd well and see good fruit for the labours of your people, that we might equip each person for the work of ministry that you have called each to. And Father, to that end, we think of our missionary purpose. We think of uh, people who are doing local mission elsewhere. Uh, we give you thanks uh, for Maddie and, and having uh, been with us for some time and now taken uh, a mission uh, expedition to uh, Slovenia and uh, working with the AFES team over there, we pray that you would be with them all, uh, help them to be effective in communicating the gospel and uh, doing the work that they went to do and then bring them home safely in the coming weeks, that they might return to us full of 
uh, wonderful stories and the way that you have worked uh, through them and done your good work in other places. Father, we think of the Mantons too, as we read in the Staying in Touch, uh, as it was circulated yesterday. For their work among Indigenous people, we thank you for the way they are able to identify with uh, Aboriginal culture, and we pray that as they share the Gospel and minister to uh, the Indigenous people among us uh, in this nation, that they would do so without compromise of the Gospel that they would be able to speak in a way that is understood and that the message of the gospel can uh, cut across the cultural differences, uh, that the gospel might be clear and powerful and draw people out of uh, submission to evil and, and to wrong thinking, wrong understanding, and that all these people might uh, come to a knowledge of the truth, even as you have broken in upon us and our wrong beliefs and wrong understandings and brought to us the light of the gospel. Be powerful and effective among the people of this nation, we pray. Father, we think of our own uh, mission activity, our own mission purpose for each of us as individuals. We are indeed missionaries. We ask that you continue to equip us as a congregation, equip us as individuals, empower us, excite us with the gospel, that we wouldn't be able to contain it, but rather share it with all that we come in contact with, that it would overflow in blessing through us to others, that we might lift Christ up and all people be drawn to him. And to that end, we pray that you would bless the offerings that we brought, the money given during the week and, uh, and that might even be given today, that it would all be used well, give wisdom and guidance to the board as they distribute it, that it might multiply and do good. We pray all of these things and the private prayers of our hearts in the name of Christ and for his sake. Amen. Let's join together now in responding uh, with the song, Blessed Be Your Name. Blessed be your name. 
Well, friends, lift up your hearts and receive the blessing of the Lord. Lord, bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his counts upon you and grant you his peace, both now and forevermore. Amen.